Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Kaufman, uh, the co-founder, executive vice president, chief medical officer of the nonprofit CLL Society. Dr. Sitlinger, could you please introduce yourself and tell us about some of your important research? Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for having me today. Uh, I am Dr. Adria Settlinger. I am an assistant professor at Duke um, Medical Cancer Center, and I specialize in treating patients with CLL and other mature or indolent, as some people call it, B-cell lymphomas. Um, and I specifically in my research areas look at outcomes research, such as how we can utilize exercise and other adjuvants to help care, to help improve the health of our patients. Well, one of the things that the present pandemic has really brought into focus is how chronic lymphocytic leukemia patients, small uh, lymphocytic lymphoma patients are immunocompromised. Uh, could you explain a little bit about that? Because that pertains to the research you're going to discuss. Absolutely. So our CLL or SLL patients um, have a, kind of multiple areas where their immune system isn't working as well as individuals without these cancers. And part of that is one, the cancer that they have is of the immune system. And thus that the immune system itself, the B cell is not working as well. And so to fight infections, it's the way I explain it, to a lot of patients is it's like an army, it's our military. You have multiple lines and branches of defense. And when you have CLL or SLL, it's actually multiple areas in that army that are not working as well as you would like. So you have gamma globulins, which are the end product of your immune system to help fight off if they see an infection or see something that isn't supposed to be there. And those tend to be low. And so that's something called IgG um, tend to be low and you that then you cannot fight infection as well. Similarly, some of our T cells, which is another part of that army, um, also tend to be affected, especially the longer you have had CLL or SLL. So the, another way to look at this is the kind of liquid or humoral immune system, mm -hmm. which is the antibodies or the immune globulins. And the other is the cellular, the actual soldiers, and some of our, are controlling other soldiers and some are That's the right. actual fighters. And that, so the first group tends to be the B cells and the second group, the T cells. It's not quite that simple, but um, the immune exactly. system. Is but it, they're working together and they're, none of them are working up to snuff as you would like. And there's even another part to this that I think is dysfunctional in CLL, and that's the innate immune system. Can you explain the difference between the innate and adaptive immune system for us? Sure thing. So you have the cells that are your body is making to identify infection, the initial front line, as I would like to, I usually the kind of the people that might storm the battleship initially. Um, and that is when, and those are some of your systems like your neutrophils and things of that nature that you might be monitoring that are your innate system to fight infection. Then you have your adaptive where you have that your body has learned how to fight infections. So for example, over time you have seen various infections as a child and your body now has antibodies that they have built and are able to then recognize if it comes into contact again with that type of infection and then can just quickly fight it off. And so you have these two systems, the first wave, the first line, and then the second wave that goes behind and has all knows what to do, has seen these things before and is then supposed to be able to wipe out that infection so you don't get as sick again, for example. So we know that we have a compromised immune system. We know that vaccines don't work as well for us. We know that if we do get infected, we tend to have more dire outcomes. And one of the questions I get constantly asked is, is there anything I can do for this? Is there an herbal product? Is there any lifestyle thing? And this is what your research is about. So tell us what you discovered and explain that to us. So absolutely. So what we were looking to see was there's a growing body of evidence in exercise and the immune system 
both humoral and adaptive in healthy individuals. And what, how the immune, you can impact your immune system with various types of exercise. Um, and there's growing evidence that exercise can do a lot of great things for people with various cancers. So of course the largest body of evidence is in breast cancer. Um, and, but a lot of it's in survivors or people who have, are no, you know, have had treatment and no longer on treatment and clear of disease. There's not a lot of data or not a lot of research that have been done in people with chronic cancers or longer term cancers, um, especially in CLL where you've got your immune system is impacted by the disease itself. And so what we wanted to do was do a pilot study first and foremost, just to see how people tolerated higher intensity tra training um, exercise, which I'll talk about um, in a moment, but, and then, and also look at the small subset. So it's just a pilot study to then look at how the immune system works in this situation. So what is high intensity interval training? Um, it sounds like something I want to uh, run away from, but maybe I'd be getting high intensity training if I ran away from it. Yeah. <laughs> So there's basically high intensity interval training is when you do short periods of very demanding physical activity, alternating with then less intense in a recovery period. So it's, it depends a bit on the different definition, but usually you're doing short bursts, 30 to 90 seconds of really high intensity activity, say getting your heart rate at 80% of max, and then bring it back down with, and then do it again. And it usually spans 20 to 30 minutes or even less than that, depending on what you read. And so for our patients, we did both high interval intensity training on the treadmill, um, getting to that max, what we would call a VO2 peak or a heart rate basically helps us create what that max threshold is. And then we would also do maxing out of weights. So it was a combination of the two, three times a week. Three times a week. So how long would these sessions last um, between It was the... about an hour in total. The third, it was 30 minutes when with the um, actual treadmill component. And then depending on how long we had various weight machines that we were doing. So depending on how long that took, the whole thing was about an hour. So I have to ask you, we know that CLL tends to be a disease of older people uh, who often have other comorbidities. So was there any screening that people had to do before they got their heart rate up to 80? Were um, any cardi Did you work with your friends in cardiology or primary care to screen these pa uh, patients yes. before so they entered did, this? Mm -hmm. So we did something called the cardiopulmonary exercise test or CPET for short. Um, and this is basically you get a, um, you're hooked up to a, a 12 lead EKG and you've got kind of, uh, ox, you're measuring your, your actually CO2 output and we're monitoring that and a cardiologist looks at that. So that's actually was part of our screening, but then also part of our testing. So we did that at, again at the end of the 12 weeks. And then again, at 12 weeks later when you were off of the actual study uh, sessions, um, so it was part of our screening, but also part of our assessment. And so, of course, if anything um, was concerning on that, or there were criteria, for example, you had not had a major cardiac event in the last six months. Um, so, but you would be, we actually have, we had a variety of people. And that's what's really nice about the high, this type of training is that you can really tailor it to where someone currently is when they're starting training. So we had people who were already people exercise, people that did exercise. And then we had one woman who had never been inside a gym before. Um, so there's a, a lot of variety and you can really, by using this method, tailor the program to, to, to really maximize their benefit. So I, I think the takeaway is that, because um, when people find the results, they're going to be excited about it. But the takeaway is to, you know, check with your docs before jumping on this uh, on your own, because there are risks for at least some patients, you know. Absolutely. And I think that's true with any exercise program. I will say we did not have any events that occurred 
side that were adverse events during it, which I think really speaks to the fact that even though we had older patients and patients with comorbidities, you know, this still can be done safely, which was a really important part of this pilot was to make sure that we could do it. I mean, our average age of our patients was almost 67. So, you know, it wasn't the youngest or oldest group, but it was a mix. And so that is uh, reassuring that this can be done as long as you get that approval from your physician. So what did you find? Yes. So we found significant effects, particularly increases in strength um, across the between the control group and the interval group. And I should say that the control group was just told to kind of abide by the the standard guidelines for exercise, 150 minutes a week, that kind of thing. So we didn't, we did give them the guidelines from that the United States task force puts out, but there was no um, uh, any, or any activity given. And so we found a significant increase in their strength. And then when we looked at the cells, so what we did is we took blood samples from each patient at the beginning, basically when we did all of the analysis with those cardiovascular trainings um, and took a look at those cells. And what we did was then compare, have the, put, take them in a lab and then compare them and see what, for example, the NK cells or the natural killer cells, this is part of that innate immunity that says, I'm going to go destroy something that shouldn't be there. And so we took that and put it in a, in a tube um, and a plate with, for example, CL, a cell that was designed to be a CLL cell. And we said, well, what do they do? And we found that our patients in the exercise group had significantly higher natural killer cell killing of those cells. And we were very excited about that finding. Um, one interesting finding that of, I will say, because you have to sit, report both sides of the research, is that um, with the actual cardiorespiratory fitness, we actually didn't find a significant change on that side. In fact, the controls did a little better. And I do want to mention that um, if you're reading the study. And we think a lot of that is somewhat that the control selection bias, because of course, those patients that were getting, were enrolling in this trial were also interested in this. And so even though we weren't giving them a special designated program, like we were, a lot of those patients, when we talked to them and when we get back the training and that, because we were giving them more monitoring, were doing exercise, which is great. We want them to be doing it, but it does add a level of uh, complicating factors. But overall, we were beyond thrilled with such a small sample size that we were finding these results. And I, sh I should say, I mentioned it earlier, you know, the primary objective was the feasibility. And we did find that this was feasible. We didn't have any adverse events um, and that all, you know, we were looking to make sure that at least um, 75% or more of our sessions were completed and all of our participants did that. So this wouldn't be something that a patient could monitor themselves. Like they couldn't go and get a complete blood count or a blood chemistry or immune globulin level and see a change. The test you're describing is a very sophisticated, uh, specialized lab, right? I couldn't Correct. go and say, oh, look at my neutrophils are better, my lymphocytes are more controlled. I, I wouldn't see that at least preliminarily at this point. Is that correct? Correct. Not at yeah. this point. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, you know, part of this pilot that I think is really as exciting, of course, is what do pilots do, but generate the next many, many studies. And I think that's part of all what we're going to tease out is we need to obviously examine this as much, much bigger samples to see what signals hold in the future um, or further. And then, you know, how could we utilize this? So not only how do we tailor exercise programs, I think that's one thing is, you know, it's really hard when you're told just to walk, which is great, but can we actually help patients 
using things like blood counts to tailor exercise programs to actually augment or improve how their CLL does. And as you pointed out, specifically, not just how can we improve their, maybe improve the CLL so they need treatment later or respond better to treatment, kind of a synergistic effect. That's all things that we wanna look at in the future, but also things like fighting infection and how can we make it safer to just be out in the world in a place like COVID and can exercise be a part of that solution. Any final thoughts or words you would want to say to the uh, uh, CLL, SLL community about this? Uh, stay tuned. And if you're interested, you know, we are going to be attempting to get more and more of these studies out, not just in treatment naive patients, but in treated patients. Um, but the first thing I could do is just encourage you to stay active. Do talk to your doctor, but don't be afraid to get involved in more intense uh, exercise programs if possible. Um, and we'll continue to be looking into this information. Uh, but definitely, definitely something that you should be considering as part of your CLL treatment is how can I keep myself as active as possible? Dr. Sittlinger, this is so important and I'm so grateful for this research. And if you do have other things going on, please reach out and we'll put it up on the CLL Society website. And we'll put up a link to this uh, important research because people ask and it's so important to feel you have some control over what's going on with you and this is a way for us to get a control it involves some discipline it involves some work but it's actually some control i'm a big believer in you have to take care of yourself um in terms of exercise diet sleep you know, your emotional status, all of that stuff. So thank you so much for what you and your colleagues are doing. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. This is wonderful. And, and thank you to everyone um, for your interest. I'm very excited about this next, next line of field of this area. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah.